Hello everyone, welcome back to the virtual classroom and today we're going to be talking about the great outdoors and how you deal with accident scenes, onlookers, and to a certain extent uh, police personnel. So let's get started. Over the past several weeks, we've explored the sequence and the techniques for documenting an indoor crime scene. But as we all know, crimes can happen anywhere at any time in any different kind of uh, weather condition you can imagine. So we need to be prepared for the photographic situations that occur outside of normal residences. And the images below show you just a few examples of the conditions um, that crime scene photographers and police personnel have to deal with. If you work in Arizona, like I do uh, for the city of Phoenix, um, you can be dealing with desert scenes um, on a regular basis. And desert scenes can be very trying on the photographer, mainly because of heat <laughs> and um, the lack of shade. Uh, but there are also some photographic considerations we're going to talk about a little bit. And if you live in an area like Seattle, where it rains all the time, that comes with its own um, conditions that you have to deal with. And uh, these poor guys down in the center of the screen here are dealing with a crime scene in the middle of a snowy mess. Um, so. Obviously, it depends on the area that you live in, uh, the types of conditions that you're going to run into, but it's something that you need to be prepared for uh, no matter where you live. So let's talk about some of the situations and how you deal with them. Now, as far as photography goes, large open areas can be a problem, okay? And in large open areas like parks or a large section of the desert or even um, large areas that are heavily wooded uh, like the forests um, on, on the East Coast, you want to remember to keep the key features of your photograph overlapping, right? It's the same thing that we talked about with indoor uh, photography. It's very easy for a viewer to become disoriented when the images that they're looking at contain similar subject matter. So in this situation, uh, with the park that you're looking at, Central Park actually, um, if you're looking at the buildings behind you, those are key features. So if we pan to the left and took another picture showing those two towers in the back, then that's going to help orient your viewer. This can be kind of difficult to do, especially if you're out in a desert where everything looks the same. Everything's just sand. <laughs> so it can be uh, difficult to do, but it's important to remember to try and overlap um, any key features that you have so your viewer doesn't get disoriented. Now, the lighting situation for this type of scene can be particularly challenging, too. Um, and this concept of painting with light, that's how you deal with large open areas with no light source around, we're going to explore that more in crime scene photography, too. Um, so not something that you guys have to worry about uh, for photo one, but something to keep in mind uh, for future class. So let's talk about accident scenes a little bit. Accident scenes are probably the most common outdoor scene that crime scene photographers run into. And the key concept to keep in mind when photographing these scenes is to be thorough. So if your scene is contained in an area, like an intersection, um, or to a certain extent a park that has you know, crime scene tape creating a perimeter, you want to think of that crime scene tape as the walls of the room. Okay, so in this situation, let's assume that an accident occurred in the middle of this intersection. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to four-point it, just the same way you would an indoor crime scene, okay? You're going to move around to each of the corners, photographing back towards the opposite corner to make sure that you thoroughly document the accident scene. Okay. Now, there, your book's going to list off a bunch of different considerations that you need to take when photographing accident scenes in the areas surrounding the accident. So, views um, coming towards the accident, uh, roadway signs, things like that that could actually be blocks away from the actual intersection scene. And these are all um, very important to keep in mind. So, be sure that you do your textbook reading for this week.
So when you arrive on an accident scene, don't let your natural curiosity dictate how you photograph the scene. Okay, remember that crime scene photographs aren't just visual depictions of a crime scene. They are, but they're also going to help crime scene investigators with report writing, and they're also going to help crime scene investigators create diagrams. Remember when we were talking about the indoor crime scene that seeing the location of evidence relating to each other, that's going to help you make a, a good diagram, figuring out, okay, this item was north of here, or this item was south of this other item. Okay, that's really important. It can be especially important in big outdoor scenes where it's really hard to um, place yourself exactly in the scene because it's not as contained, right, as an indoor scene. So we want to begin our scene the way we always do by orienting the viewer to the location. So in this situation of the accident scene that I'm going to show you, it happened at the intersection of Indian School and 83rd Avenue. So I'm taking photographs of both street signs. Now realize that I've made both of those street signs important key features, right? They're both uh, dead on to the camera. That's because the, it happened at an intersection. So here's a safety alert for you guys, okay? Whenever you're working in a roadway or near a roadway, it's important to wear a reflective traffic vest. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, onlookers are often distracted by the commotion of a scene, and this can be really dangerous for you as a photographer. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people try to drive through police barricades. <laughs> you would think uh, that if you saw a big mess in the middle of the roadway, you would turn around and go the other way, but that is not the case, okay? The other element of this is that while the onlookers and the people driving by your scene can definitely be distracted and can actually cause other accidents, you're going to be distracted too. Um, as a photographer, your face is usually right down there, right? Right down in, you know, in the viewfinder, making sure that you're getting the right shot. That can give you tunnel vision and that can be really, really dangerous, um, especially if you step out into the roadway to take a photograph and somebody blows by the barricade or or doesn't realize that there's a barricade there. Okay, so that can be a very dangerous situation. So you always want to be sure that you're wearing your traffic vest if you're in or around a roadway. If you're located in an intersection, you want to be sure that you photograph the crash site from all four corners. Okay, so you want to be sure that you're photographing standing on, say, the northeast corner, facing southeast, and then rotate down to the southeast corner, facing northwest. You want to be sure to capture the accident area from all the different corners of the intersection. That's going to make sure that you get some really nice overall shots that are going to orient your viewer. Okay, so this is me just moving around the accident scene. As you can see, there are four vehicles involved um, in this crime scene. Well, in this section of the crime scene, there was actually a shooting scene about four miles to the west. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but these overall shots are just orienting the viewer to show them where, our, where the parameters of the scene are. You'll see that I'm focusing in on each vehicle, but each shot before the vehicle showed it overlapping with some other part of the scene. So we know now that, say, we're facing south, looking towards the white truck. We know that a little bit to the east, there is the black SUV that you can still see. And from the mid-range and overall shots that we showed you uh, a slide ago, you know that there's another vehicle that was involved a little bit farther east. So these overall shots are making sure that the viewer knows which vehicles we're focusing on and where they're located in relation to each other. As you can see, we're moving a little bit more east now, and you can see the other two white sedans that are also located in the scene. Now we've switched corners, right? So if we're facing south right now, we're pretty far east, and we're facing actually southwest. And you can see how I've added in the buildings in the background, um, the Firestone sign. All of these are fixed features in the crime scene that help the or help 
the viewer orient themselves, right? So make sure that with your overalls you take overlapping shots so that the viewer can still orient themselves no matter which photograph they're looking at. Now if you follow these shots from the upper left hand corner um, over to the upper right hand corner and then down to the bottom, I'm centering in on a certain section of the roadway because there's debris there. And debris is very important, especially to um, accident reconstructionists. So remember, while the vehicles are important and the damage that the vehicle sustained is important, the information that the debris on the roadway can give you is also very important. So you want to make sure that you thoroughly photograph um, any debris that you find near the vehicles. So here we're moving into our vehicle shots. And our vehicle shots are going to be the same whether we're talking about documenting a vehicle on an accident scene or documenting a vehicle during a vehicle examination, which is something we're going to talk about um, later in the week. So your first shot, when you want to document a vehicle, I like to start at the back of the vehicle. Um, you can start wherever you like, as long as you get all four sides in your overall shots. But it does help to sometimes start in the same position each time you do vehicle shots. That way you tend to get into a pattern and you tend to not forget um, important uh, shots. So in this one I started um, just with the rear of the SUV. I take an overall of the rear of the vehicle however it is on scene and then I take a close-up of the um, vehicle's license plate. Now there's damage going on in the lower section of the vehicle so because I'm already centered in on that area and I've already drawn my viewers attention there I want to be sure to document that as I go. So now we're moving around to the passenger side of the vehicle. And as you can see, in this situation, sometimes the sunlight is not your friend. <laughs> it can actually work against you. We've talked about um, low lit scenes, but the opposite can be a problem as well. You know, your shutter speed can only go so fast and your aperture can only close down so much. So the reason that these shots are a little difficult is because we have a dark vehicle right and there is a ton of sunlight in that scene so that um, lower left hand corner shot there's no flash involved with that image um, that's just a lot of sun and I am actually the vehicle is actually being backlit the sun is facing me and I'm pointing into the sun uh, trying to photograph that passenger side of the vehicle so I'm going to show you a little trick in this next side uh, that can actually help you now you'll see that's my hand <laughs> right on the top of the uh, the slide there um, and what you can do is you can make a makeshift uh, lens hood you guys have probably seen uh, lens hoods being used by professional photographers or maybe um, you've seen them at camera shops they're basically plastic that fit around your lens and they keep the sunlight from actually coming in at different directions uh, into your lens. So you can do, you can make a hood yourself basically using your hand by holding your hand just a little bit um, above the lens and hopefully not getting too much of it in the shot. In this situation because the sun was in the position that it was and the vehicle was in the position when, that it was, there's not much I can do about um, the backlighting or the shadow. So I would rather have a little bit of my hand in this shot and make sure that I can make out all the damage on the passenger side um, instead of dealing with that backlight issue. So that's a trick that you can use on super sunny days, which we have a lot of in Arizona. Okay, for the tire close-ups, especially if there's damage to the tire, you want to be sure to orient your viewer first to tell them, okay, this is the tire that I'm focusing in on. So in this shot, the upper left-hand corner shot, I've shown you we're focusing in on the passenger side rear tire, and then I have a close-up shot of the actual tire that we've focused in on. And we're continuing our documentation of the vehicle. The uh, front end, the hood, the front driver's side fender, and the exterior of the driver's side. 
And there are actually a lot more photographs involved in this scene as I work through and do close-ups on um, the damage that you see. But for time's sake, I think you guys get the general idea. You want to start at one part of the vehicle, whether it's the front, the driver's side, the back, it's your decision. But you want to make sure that you thoroughly photograph all four sides of the vehicle. That's what we call four-pointing the vehicle. And this is another close-up shot of the rear driver's side tire, as you can see. Uh, the damage to this vehicle is pretty extensive. Now, don't forget that sometimes the most important evidence is surrounding the vehicle and not in it. In this particular investigation, um, there was a gang shooting at a party, and the victim's friends uh, pulled him from the house, threw him into a vehicle, and started driving him radically to the hospital. They then got into this four-car pileup that you see here. Now, the, vi the victim was dead on scene, um, but we also had two other bleeders that fled the scene. And this is a partial shoe print that we found approximately, I'd say, 100 feet from the accident scene. Uh, we followed a blood trail that led into this part of the cement, and we found partial bloody shoe prints there. So accidents are very, very dynamic, and you need to be sure that you were completely and thoroughly documenting the area surrounding the crash and not just the vehicles themselves. Interior shots to be aware of um, when photographing accident scenes. Airbags are very, very important not only because it can tell you the velocity that the car was moving at, but it will also possibly be a great source of DNA, right? An airbag explodes in your face. What's on your face? Your mouth, your nose, possibly blood if you were injured. So if you're trying to figure out who was driving the vehicle and you arrive on scene at an accident scene and no one's there, um, the airbags are very important to document and they're also very important to take. Um, if you haven't tried to cut an airbag out of a steering wheel before, <laughs> let me tell you, it's a little difficult. Um, the best tool to use is actually uh, a disposable scalpel. So just uh, tuck that away in your uh, toolkit for when you guys are actually out on these scenes collecting this evidence. Seat belts and seat conditions are also very important. Um, if you arrive on a scene like this and you don't know who the driver was, if the seat belt is frayed or if it's stretched out, um, it is possible that the person was wearing the seat belt during the crash. So if you're looking for the driver and looking for the passenger, if both seat belts are deformed in some way, you want to make sure that you photograph them and then look for corresponding injuries on your suspected driver or passenger. And obviously, any damage to the windows are also going to be very important. Um, this is not quite what we call a bullseye, but it's close. Um, when people's heads make impact into the inside of the front uh, windshield, they make kind of stellate patterns like this. Um, obviously, these can also be a good area uh, to look for for DNA. Um, here's a little side note about accident investigation. If you work for a larger agency, you might actually be working in tandem with a vehicular crime unit. So at Phoenix PD, uh, because this was an accident scene and a homicide scene rolled into one, my unit got called out, but so did the vehicular crimes unit. And a lot of the times, you guys can work together. Um, the vehicular crime unit has some spectacular diagramming tools that they use on a regular basis. We, we have similar tools, but um, they are a lot more comfortable with them and they use them a lot more than we do. So on this particular scene, the vehicular crime unit diagrammed the scene and we conducted the rest of the investigation. So if you work with other units, be sure that you understand the equipment that they're using and make sure that you get the shots that they need. So in, in this example, the vehicular crimes unit was using the orange cones, the blue cones, the blue cones with red dots, and the yellow cones with green dots to indicate to them um, different events. So the scuffs on the pavement there and the tire tracks, they're documenting these in their own way. So I probably have about 
I don't know, close to 300 photographs just for them that I took of the placards and the cones that they put down. So if you're working with another unit, just be sure that um, you have good communication with them and you know what they're looking for in your crime scene photos because they'll be using them for their report as well. Here are some equipment issues that you guys uh, need to be aware of when you're dealing with outdoor scenes. Now, outdoor crime scenes can be challenging for the photographer, like we talked about, but they can also wreak havoc on your equipment. So you want to be sure that you keep your camera dry and protected when photographing an outdoor scene. Uh, our cameras, for the most part, are digital, right? So they don't like being wet, and they don't like being extremely hot. So crime scene photographers in areas where it's raining and you don't have a choice, you've got to photograph in the rain. There's some considerations to take into um, with your shutter speed and flash and different things like that. Um, but in general, you want to be sure that your camera does not get wet. So there's some tricks for that. You can walk around with an umbrella, which I do <laughs> sometimes. It does actually rain in Phoenix every once in a while. And the other um, solution that some crime scene photographers have come up with is basically wrapping the body of their camera um, in a plastic bag to keep it from getting wet. So that's an option. The other situation is that pretty much all digital equipment, including digital cameras, do not like being in extreme hot situations, okay? That can really uh, fry the internal components of your camera. So um, there's some tricks that I use uh, on Phoenix crime scenes when it's really hot, I'll usually leave my van running, leave AC going in there so that when I'm done with photography, I can put my camera back into its case and leave it in the van, uh, which will remain cool on the crime scene. So that's a little trick that I use to deal with the extreme heat in, in Phoenix. So here are some procedural considerations um, that you need to be aware of. Crime scenes don't happen in a bubble, um, especially if they're an outdoor scene. Okay, so onlookers, uh, people are naturally curious, and you're definitely going to get some people approaching you at some point in your career asking you what's going on. Um, I find it's always best to have basically a can response ready, and I basically say the same thing no matter what crime scene I'm on sir or ma'am if it's a woman uh, it's an ongoing investigation and I really can't comment on, on it at this time and then I go about my business um, police personnel usually have designated uh, commanders or lieutenants especially in larger agencies like Phoenix that are PR relations experts okay and they're the ones that are going to talk to the news crew and they're going to give the response that the department uh, feels comfortable giving. So it's really important for you as the crime scene personnel, um, even though you're on scene and you're involved in the investigation, it's really not your responsibility to convey information to onlookers. Um, so I would stay away from that. Now here is another group of people that we have to deal with as crime scene photographers, and that's investigative personnel. Um, police officers and detectives on your scene have a very important job to do, and usually you work in tandem with them, okay? You're going to work hand in hand with police officers and detectives to get information and to give information. Um, and it's very important that it's a team effort that goes on, okay? but. Many times, they will try to do their job, their very important investigating job, standing right in the middle of your scene, okay? And that's a problem because you need to photograph the scene without uh, obstacles in it, right? You have to show um, certain key features of the scene, and having people standing in the middle of it is not conducive to that, okay? So asking personnel to move out of your shots is an important step in crime scene photography. Basically, if I'm standing in front of a crew of detectives or SWAT team members or whatever, and they're standing around talking after, um, you know, entering a home or they're talking about the investigation and looking at different items, they know that photography is the first step for the investigation. Um, so usually I'll say, hey guys, you know, I'm getting ready to take photos. You guys want to all move to the right or to the left. I don't get crazy authoritative about it. I just let them know that I'm, I need to do my job, right? Um, usually that works. If not, I find that um, a well-timed flash burst can often do the trick. So I don't actually take a photograph. I just make my flash fire off. And uh, when investigative personnel see that, uh, they go, oh, I'm in the photos. And then they jump over to the left or to the right. Okay, So that's a way that you can deal with investigative personnel who will undoubtedly be milling about your scene at one point during the investigation.
So to wrap it up, okay, thoroughness and overlapping key elements of your scene, that's really extremely important when dealing with accident scenes or, or large outdoor scenes. It's important for any scene, right? We've talked about that repeatedly throughout the past couple weeks, but it's especially important for these scenes because it can be so disorienting to the viewer. And um, outdoors can be a very dangerous place for digital camera equipment as well as crime scene photographers. So you need to be aware of that and you need to uh, take precautions to protect yourself and to protect your equipment. And the last concept is onlookers and police personnel can become obstacles all on their own. So you need to be prepared for working with them. If you guys have any questions about the lecture, please feel free to email your instructor and be sure that you rewatch this video as you work through your assignments for this week. See you guys in the classroom.